Hey everybody, this is Seth Williams from the RE Tipster blog and the RE Tipster podcast. Got a really cool guest today that I'm having a conversation with. This guy is actually a friend of mine who I've known for several years now um, in several different contexts. Uh, his name is Rob Hughes, and Rob is a certified story brand guide, among other things. Uh, but Rob, he introduced me to uh, something called story brand this past year, which has really like had a huge impact on me, just the way I see my business and my marketing efforts, just the way I like think about it and approach it. And it's something that I think can be used in pretty much any business on any level. Uh, and today we're going to talk just a little bit about, you know, what story brand is, what it's all about, how it can potentially help you. And I guess more specifically, how it can apply to the world of real estate professionals and real estate investors. Um, so Rob, how you doing? Yeah, good, Seth. Hey, it's a pleasure to be with you here on the podcast, on the, uh, the video here. Uh, pleasure to speak with uh, you know, your group as well. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. Appreciate it. So just to kick this off, I'm wondering, you know, if in a minute or two or however long it takes, uh, can you just explain the essence of what you do? Like what is story brand? Yeah. Why is it important? How does this all work? Yeah, well, my role uh, with StoryBrand, I'm a certified StoryBrand guide, and essentially that functions as a marketing agency, uh, so, so to speak, that helps partner with people to fully implement uh, their investment made in StoryBrand. Um, so I guess, you know, beyond my role, what is StoryBrand? What's the story-braced marketing? If you pick up an entrepreneur magazine or some business magazine, uh, you don't have to flip too many pages into it to see story is becoming an increasingly hot topic uh, in the area of advertising, marketing, and clear messaging. Um, StoryBrand has really leveraged some powerful, powerful tools that can really help clarify a business's message so that customers know how to engage with them even more. And ultimately, that translates into higher sales and, and higher revenue for the company. Yeah, and this is something that I have actually noticed uh, with a number of the different bloggers and YouTubers and podcasters that I follow. I really noticed it for years, and I've heard people talking about the importance of using stories to communicate your message. Yeah. And it's one of those things where, like, when I hear a good story, even if it's like just a minute long or something like that, like yeah. I recognize it and it totally works and it catches my attention. But like something that I have struggled with is like, how do I replicate that? Like, like yeah. is there some kind of formula that I have to use to take whatever my message is and craft it into a story and, yeah. you know, reproduce that? And I, for the longest time, I could not figure out how to do it. Like, I just, I didn't get how people were doing that just on the spot. And um, yeah. that was one of the big eye openers for me when I, you know, read the book, uh, what is it called? Story Brand or Becoming a... Building a Story Brand. Building a Story Brand, that's right. Um, which is by uh, an author named Donald Miller, and That's he's right. written a number of other books. Great author, has great writing, and really this whole story brand concept that he, you know, put together, it makes a lot of sense, and does a really good job of explaining how it works. Um, but really, it wasn't until I read that book and went through his online course that, like, it really started to make sense. Like, I sort of figured out, oh, so that's how you craft things into a story and make it sound compelling and interesting. That's right. There, there is a very specific formula that works like across the board. You can apply yeah. it to pretty much anything and you can see this in like the Hollywood movie industry, like, you know, books and stories. Yep. Like there is definitely certain elements that are required in a very good story. And he explains that really well. Yeah. And, and perhaps maybe we can kind of go over some of those uh, with your audience here today. I mean, the essence of story, first of all, when you hear the word story, many of you think, oh, once upon a time style stories. We're really not talking about that. Um, story is simply a sense-making device. The human brain uh, actually daydreams about 30% of the time. And a story is a way of capturing a person's attention for as much as 90 to even 120 minutes, so two hours, and captivate them in a compelling story that they could see themselves in to help them focus their attention on a particular uh, topic for some time. Think about the most recent movie that you saw, whether in the theater or on Netflix. What was the length of that movie? Unless it was like a, um, you know, one of those um, shows that you watch on Netflix that you just kind of get, you know, stuck on for mm -hmm. hours and hours, like, you know, whatever. But anyway, um, you know, movies, 90 to 120 minutes. 
Mm -hmm. uh, story is the age old mechanism of communication. And essentially Don Miller has taken seven essential elements of well-told stories and created a marketing framework that any company can use to help to clarify their message so that customers, prospective customers, or any constituent that you're trying to reach with a message can see themselves and how they will benefit through engaging your business or your opportunity. That is the essence of, of story in the realms of marketing. The human brain uh, also is really designed for two things. Uh, the first mechanism that the human brain is designed to help you do is to survive and to thrive. If you're like me, one of the first things you do when you wake up is think about, well, where's the coffee, right? I don't have to think about that very hard because my human brain naturally says, hey, Rob, <laughs> whether it's a matter of surviving or thriving, you need to go find this coffee and go here. Also, that mechanism kicks in if you're at a public place. Chances are one of the first things that you pay attention to are where are the exits? And if there's going to be food that's provided, you know, where's the food going to be at? Because if there's a fire, you got to know how to escape. And if you get hungry and you need to thrive, you need to know where the food's at. So surviving and thriving is the first mechanism. So people naturally want to engage stories that can trigger that hot button for them in their human brain. Is this person's story, whether it be the RE Tipster blog or other websites or other marketing that they engage, is this marketing communicated in such a way that's going to help me, the viewer, figure out how I can survive and thrive? Okay, so that's the kind of the first test of a well-told marketing story. Mm -hmm. The second test of a well-told marketing story is if it's done clearly and concisely, the fewest amount of calories. Um, Seth, you're a blogger. <clears throat> so uh, how many hours or minutes would you say it takes you to write your average blog post? Oh, man, I'd say at a minimum four hours on average, more like eight hours per blog post. So four to eight hours. And after the four to eight hour experience of just using your brain and your fingers to type, are you exhausted ever on the back end of that? Uh, sometimes. Yeah, you can be. So if, you know, authors who sit down and write books or if you do any kind of thought intensive work, um, even though you're just using your brain, your brain is constantly blowtorching those calories. And when you're using your brain to really try to figure things out and to think in a way that creates clarity for others, it can really take a lot of, uh, a lot of calories to be consumed in that. So, yeah. In essence, what we're trying to do is say, hey, we want to help people survive and thrive in the quickest method possible, the quickest and clearest and concise message uh, that we can get them to, to conserve calories. Mm -hmm. Case in point, I'm not here to advocate a political affiliation whatsoever, but I'm here to tell you that the majority of your listeners will probably be able to answer the following question. What was Donald Trump's campaign speech? What was his slogan? Do you want me to answer that right now? Yeah, give it a try. I believe it's Make America Great Again. Is that what it was? Ding. If we if you have a little bell, you should, you know, make a little bell icon <laughs> pop up. That's correct, right? Yeah, true. Make America Great Again. Question. What was Hillary Clinton's? Um uh, Exactly. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. What was Barack Obama's in four years ago, five years ago? Was it uh change or something like that or change uh, we can believe in yeah does that ring a bell yeah what was john mccain's we don't remember yeah. Yeah. change we can believe in that connects to my survive and thrive mechanism it's simple it's portable it's low calorie consumption make america great again that connects to my survive thrive mechanism it's simple is it an elaborate plan absolutely not and many will debate that probably through the entire term of our current presidency However, it's a portable statement, low calories, survive and thrive. People can carry it with them. That's the effective use of, uh, of a message statement like that. Mm -hmm. So my hope today is that we'll equip your viewers with some and listeners um, with, with some of these tools to be able to craft a great message that they may have in a way that people actually want to listen to and more importantly can carry with them and to be an advocate for their, uh, their organization or company uh, or business. Yeah, no. When you're talking about like those slogans and things like that, like one of the first things that comes to my mind when I think of that stuff is like my website. I know yeah. like, for example, the, I'm using WordPress for my buying site and the theme that I have, like it makes room for a big, bold statement right when somebody lands on the page. So, mm -hmm. you know, basically only enough room to fit in like one, maybe two short sentences. And I've seen other websites where you land on it and it's just like, 
chaos. Like there's yeah. just stuff all over the place. There's pictures, there's words. Like you don't really know what to look at first. Yeah. It's one of those things where like, what, what, what is it Donald Beller says? If you confuse, you lose. Like if you don't really make it clear what you do, what you can offer, then people are gone. Like you really have to dumb it down and simplify it, right? That's exactly. You've read the book. If you confuse, you lose. A mm. noise, all of those different distractions truly is kind of the enemy that the story brand methodology and toolkit is there to solve. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we try to help cut through that noise. And actually, yeah, you bring up websites, any branding and marketing collateral that you end up using, whether it be email campaigns, websites, sales letters, even um, hopefully today we'll have some chance to talk about a transitional call to action, some lead generating asset that you can load to your website that entices people who are interested in your message to raise their hand and say, I'm here uh, in exchange for value. All of that can be crafted leveraging the powerful tool that is story. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, there's a couple different, different directions we could go with this. Like, one thing that comes to mind, you actually did this for me the first time you were ever explaining what StoryBrand was all about. You, you basically uh, gave me an example of how you know, the average person talks about their company or their profession in a way that's ineffective, like the way that most people do it. And then you sort of flipped the script and you told me the exact same thing using the StoryBrand framework. Yeah, yeah. Like there was an unmistakable difference between the two yes. when you did, the, did it the right way through story brand like I was I was hooked like I had to listen to what you were saying I wonder do you have any examples off the top of your head like how would you do it ineffectively and how would you do it effectively when you explain this man, sort of thing man absolutely yes um, you know first of all I'm so guilty of this because when I encountered the story brand framework I realized I was previously talking like every other business is talking. I mean, you've heard it before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hi, I'm Rob Hughes from ABC Company. We make superior products that help simplify the lives of our clients through innovative solutions that platitude, 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 fill in the gap. Would you like to buy it? Boring. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I mean, it, but that's your average infomercial to some degree, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it, and it's actually, you know, marketing you know, 1.0 before the upgrade to 2.0, which is what your viewers are about to experience through this uh, podcast today. Mm -hmm. But marketing 1.0 is saying, hey, if you just tell people what you sell and then make it look really good on your website through imagery or videos or bells and whistles or different features, mm -hmm. you know, it's the prettiest design that's going to work. Well, you know what? Everybody began designing very elaborate websites and spending thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars wasting that money down the bucket because their message is not clear. If somebody can't tell how to engage your business, what you sell, how it's going to make their life better to survive and thrive in like three seconds, if they can't tell that, they're going to bounce right out of your page and go on to your competition. You're mm -hmm. losing sales by not clarifying your message. Mm -hmm. So again, the contrast, ABC company, we make uh, maybe for your, uh, let's use like a realtor. Mm -hmm. You know, at the ABC real estate, um, you know, we believe that our expertise over the last 30 years is your greatest asset when you sell your next property. List with us and, and we do the, this, this, and this for marketing and you know, we're gonna you know, try to get you the highest value for your home. Great. Every, any realtor could say that. Mm -hmm. A story branded realtor, somebody kind of pivots that message, uh, they try to make the story about the client and less about ABC Company. Mm -hmm. So it might sound something like this. At ABC Company, we recognize how hard it can be to sell a property that you raised your family in over the last 15 years. It can also feel quite intimidating to try to buy your next property in a market that may be at the peak of its price point. And that's why we've helped hundreds of families just like yours discover the perfect time to sell and list their property and how to maximize the value of their next purchase through our one, two, three online maximizer tool, let's say. So visit our website, uh, enter some three easy data points so that you can understand when the right time to sell your property is and what opportunities exist that you can maximize for that next purchase. So don't waste your money on your next real estate transaction. Instead, feel really confident about your next purchase by using this tool. Mm -hmm. So that story is a very different story than come here and buy this. Mm -hmm. That story is more like, hey, I'm recognizing what's keeping you up at night, how you're feeling about that. I'm providing a 
transitional tool that's not necessarily jumping right into the sale that you can engage to help alleviate some of those issues. And now all of a sudden there's inbound leads. And who do you think is going to contact ABC Real Estate, by the way, and access that tool? It's going to be people who have properties that they want to list. Mm -hmm. So it creates a more natural conversation as well in the entire business transaction. So that's just kind of an example. I don't know. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, it does. I mean, it kind of reminds me, I remember when I was uh, in college, we were taking marketing classes, kind of looking at the uh, contrast between commercials and like newspaper ads for products back in the 20s and 30s and 40s. How, you know, a lot of products, the way they would advertise it is like, look how great this product is. It's the best. Like, take this kind of medicine and, and it's the best option on the market type like that. But now it's, it's like, I think effective commercials and ads. I mean, they are focusing on an aspirational identity of their customer. Like, who does their customer want to be? Like, what is their ideal life? And sort of just like creating this picture that, you know, most people in that position are going to want and yep. associating that picture with, you know, being the result of using their product or their service or whatever it happens to be. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, the elements of a well-told story, if your listeners are listening to this, maybe they want to take some notes uh, in this section right here, because I'm going to give you three easy steps, a three-part framework, uh, just to amplifying you know, your ability to connect with your viewership um, or customer base, okay? The first step uh, in a well-told story is to understand, well, really, with those that I'm trying to reach, what problem is preventing them from living or experiencing what they want? So in the case of a, a realtor, they may be trying to reach sellers uh, that want to sell their homes. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem for them that they're uh, experiencing is that they're not sure when the right time to sell is. The market's been kind of fluctuating all over the place. And they're just unsure of themselves. Okay. So the first step, of course, is to find fluctuating markets and I feel unsure. That's the problem that my customer is trying to solve. The next step is to say, what is the solution or the product that I bring, the service or product that I bring that solves that problem? So in the case of the ABC company, it could be the online maximizer tool that helps them understand when to sell and when to buy. So again, step two is the, is the solution. What am I providing in that? Step three then is what is their aspirational identity? Who will they become on the back end of this? What does success look like on the back end of implementing this tool? So put into the three-part framework, we understand at ABC Company that you uh, are really unsure of making a buy or sell decision in this market because of how crazy the markets have been, which is why, step two, we've created this online maximizer tool, step three, that helps you calculate and understand when the right time to sell is so that you can confidently move into your next property. Mm -hmm. Do you see how quickly we went through those three? Yeah. Yeah, so step absolutely. one, the problem, step two, the solution, and step three, what does success look like after you've implemented this solution? Mm -hmm. Simply telling that is a pivot. Mm -hmm. It's a pivot away from, look at ABC Company, we are the solution, we're the hero for you. It, it's a pivot away to say, hey, we're going to come alongside of you, recognizing that you are the hero. We come alongside to provide you a product or service that makes you look like a rock star hero and leads you to success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that's kind of uh, some contrast for your uh, viewers to use. You could use that three-step framework, problem, solution, and life after. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, one of the things that I think Donald Miller was mentioning was, you know, what's at stake? Like if they succeed, if they you know, go forward with using your product or service or buying your property or whatever it is, you know, what's going to go well for them? If they don't, you know, what's, what are they going to lose? What, what, yeah. what is not going to happen or, or how is it not going to serve them well to do that? Yeah. And not necessarily like clubbing them over the head with fear tactics or anything, but just like making them aware. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, think about uh, any good story that you've encountered, whether it be through a movie or a novel or otherwise, if the story was this, Jason Bourne lives in New York city and he enjoys going to the park, playing with his kids, and experiencing harmony in life, period. Is that a good story? Just the success outcome, only the sugar in the recipe. Yeah, yeah. But if the story is Jason Bourne, 
once had a harmonious life, but his child was abducted. So mm-hmm. Jason went on a, a, a journey to rescue his daughter so that he could come back and successfully live, play at the park, and have a harmonious life afterwards. Mm-hmm. Now the contrast has entered in. Mm-hmm. So any good story has the possibility of ending in failure, but you don't, like I like what you say, you don't club them over the head with it. You don't hang out there. You position your product or service or solution to be a failure preventative and hopefully lead them toward a successful future. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the story brand realms, we like to say it's like failure is like salt in the cookie dough. If you've made cookie dough, you know you use about like a quarter teaspoon, a half teaspoon of salt, but you don't use a whole cup of it like you do sugar. Mm So just a little bit of salt provides that contrast so that the successful outcome has even more potency and resonates even deeper with the audience that you're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I've actually, I've been, since I was introduced to story brand and figuring out the whole formula that he uses, Mm -hmm. I'm sort of been just playing around with it for fun. When I put my three-year-old daughter to bed these days, um, you know, I'll read her one story book like this from you know curious george or something like that and then i will read her a story from my head where i this is harder than it sounds yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I literally like make up a story on the spot yeah. like no preparation it's just like as i go i make up a yeah. story which by the way i could never do if i yeah. didn't have the story brand framework but because i <laughs> oh well, to... well, you could but i don't think she'd have much interest in it <laughs> well, that's <laughs> just it though you, i don't know that, that's just it i um I've tried telling those stories where there is no, there's yeah. no failure. There's nothing at stake. Like nothing really bad happens. Yeah. It's like, it's like a pointless story. She like, doesn't get it. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, like, can you do like a good story now, daddy? <laughs> and, um, but as soon as you introduce like the risk or the issue or the problem or, or something, oh, yeah. that, something that will get in the way of a happy ending, that's just like, yeah. You can see it on her face. Like she's captivated by that. She has to know how it ends, how, it, yeah. how the whole story turns out. And um, yeah, so it's, it's really kind of essential to communicate like what could go wrong if yeah. the person doesn't succeed at this. Well, and that's exactly it, brother. So, I mean, let's translate that experience that you've had with your daughter in the marketing realms, in the business realms, okay? Because I think the principles are exactly the same. Mm-hmm. The practice of how it's applied, of course, in the, in the home versus the marketing world, it's very different, but the principles, exactly the same. So what you've told me is that with your daughter, you have connected with her by creating a well-told story and really identifying what is the problem that the, inside of the story, what's the plot line inside of the story. Mm-hmm. Customers, prospects, leads, potentials, you know, for whatever business your viewers are in, they want to know that you get what's, what's going on in, inside of them. They want to know that Seth gets it or whoever your viewer is. They want to know if your business gets them, understands them. Yeah. And probably the quickest way to position yourself as somebody who understands them is to identify with them what is keeping them up at night. What really is their problem? Mm-hmm. So, you know, for instance, um, if you've got a real estate wholesaler, you know, that's brokering deals and they recognize that um, they're trying to reach potential sellers that maybe have no idea what a broker does, has no idea what a wholesale transaction, broker transaction is, and it kind of intimidates them. Mm -hmm. If they can just say that, just simply say that somewhere in the marketing of, hey, we recognize at ABC Real Estate Brokering uh, Mm -hmm. that it can feel really unsure, uncertain to engage a brokered transaction. You probably have a lot of doubts. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's exactly why, again, problem. That's exactly why we've created this PDF download, three ways brokered transaction can actually make you more money Mm -hmm. um, so that you can understand and confidently maximize the sale of your real estate investment, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. There's that three-step framework again. Yeah. But by just re- repeating to them what, what their problem actually is, people say, this guy gets it. They mm-hmm. understand me. And mm-hmm. naturally, they place authority um, on you to be able to help them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so it's engaging in that story. Just like your daughter, she's, she's leaning in. She's like, okay, I want to listen to the rest of the story. Customers are going to want to listen to the rest of your story if you beat the right drumbeat uh, for them. Yes, yeah, so really to do this effectively, the pr- one of the prerequisites is you have to understand your customer, at least on some level, you know, that applies to, yeah. to people across the board, right? 
That's exactly right. So as a story brand guide, when I sit down with a client, the very first question that I, um, in process really, that I walk them through is to identify who are we trying to reach? Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. So many companies that have established businesses that have been around for 30, even 40 years, Mm -hmm. they can't clearly and concisely um, respond to that. So sometimes we have to isolate, like, what are the business units inside of your firm? Mm -hmm. You know, which, you know, percentage wise, ratio wise, which one makes the biggest voice, you know, within that, and then what's important to them. But the first step, of course, is to identify who is the target that we're trying to reach. What is the demographic or the profile? Mm -hmm. And once we've got that, we really want to ask, like, who do they really want to become? You know, what is their aspirational identity, uh, to mm-hmm. use you know, some of your phraseology there? Yeah. Um, and if that's true, what has to happen in their life? What do they want? Mm-hmm. Um, what problems are they encountering? How have I or the company or whoever is going to be the solution provider there, what have you as an organization done that would display some sort of authority in that space that you can solve that problem as the guide there? And then how do they even engage you? Do you give them a clear plan of how to engage them? Like a step one, schedule a call. Step two, fill out this assessment. Step three, we'll get you on the road to success. Something like that. Yeah. So really, I mean, you asked about target audience. You really got to figure out who you're speaking to because the whole rest of our entire process as story brand guides is going to bring you to a clear and compelling message that resonates with that target audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, as you say all that, I'm just thinking about my, you know, my land business. Whenever I'm selling uh, properties, I mean, the standard protocol is to put together a good listing, put it on Craigslist and Zillow and stuff like that. And the problem with that is, like, that's a very shotgun approach. Like, I don't really know who is going to be looking at these listings, who might be interested in that. I think depending on the type of property, like s- some properties might be more likely to attract an investor or somebody who wants to do land banking, other types of properties would be more likely to attract like a retiree or like somebody who wants to build their house on the property. Yeah. You know, others might attract uh, builders, things like that. So, I mean, if possible, based on the type of property I'm selling, try to like target who do I think is going to buy this and how can I talk to them specifically to be more effective rather than just being like, this is a great property because of these reasons. Instead, like understand, say if, it, you know, if I'm trying to sell to a builder, like yeah. understand what do builders deal with? Like what keeps them up at night? What, what is like the biggest pain for them? Mm-hmm. You know, for example, like the cost of the land that goes into building a spec house, like highlight the costs of buying land at retail value and how much that will yeah. sabotage their potential profit and how this can make all the difference in the world and multiply what otherwise would be just, just a normal profit, make it much more profitable for them. That kind of thing. Am I on the right track with that? Yeah, you absolutely are. If, if you're trying to prevent your land to be perceived as a commodity and by that, I mean, decreased value, you know, just a commodity, Mm -hmm. if you're trying to add value to it, then why wouldn't you add a story to it? I mean, I'm just thinking off cuff here. I've, I've got an ink pen here. How much is an ink pen worth? maybe a buck, let's say, yeah, sure. right? Commodity. If I just say, I've got an ink pen to sell, would you like to buy it? You'd probably say, uh, yeah, it's worth about 50 cents or a dollar to you. But what if I were to tell you a story about like John Hancock mm-hmm. signing of the Declaration of Independence and the deep, deep meaning that goes in. I showed you a, a short clip of the confidence of a very high pressured moment where contracts are to be signed and stepping up to the plate, a hand grabs this pen, confidently signs, strokes the pen ink away, and now like the town lives in liberation. Yeah. And then I offered you that same pen from that clip of that movie, mm. and I said, you have an opportunity to be a world changer. Yeah. It starts here. <laughs> that, yeah. how much would you pay for that pen? A lot more. (laughs) A lot more. Could be the exact same pen. But what you've done is you've wrapped it in a compelling narrative that boosts confidence in the person who experiences it. Mm -hmm. So that is the essence of what we do as guides. As As a certified story brand guide, I work alongside of people who may have a commoditized you know, they, they work or they serve or they sell into a commoditized industry, but they want to be differentiated. They want to be the purple cow to use a Seth Godin term 
They want to be the purple cow, the standout cow, to have amplified value, especially perceived value of their product or service, yeah. and really want to get a 10x return on their investment of time and, and resource. And that is the power of story. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of reminds me, I think I saw a McDonald's commercial like 20 years ago that was doing something like that, where like the whole commercial was like this really quick 30 second story of like two best friends who came home from college and they went out to McDonald's and enjoyed their time together and, and, you know, reminisced about the times they had growing up and all this stuff. Yeah. And the point of the commercial was to sell hamburgers from McDonald's, which if yeah. you just sell the hamburger, nobody cares about that. Like I can get right. something way better anywhere else. But when right. you sort of tie it to this story with meaning, it goes in a totally different direction and is much more compelling. That's absolutely it. Yeah. yeah, you got it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so when it comes to the properties I'm trying to sell, I'm basically like, I want to get away from the, from the notion that like, yeah, here's one property and there's a hundred others just like it on the market. Instead, it, it needs to be like, no, this is the property and here's yeah. why. Like, yeah. And you may also think too, I mean, um, you know, I imagine if you have a property to sell, it's only because you found it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just kind of thinking this may be a little bit of a rabbit trail. We can maybe have this in another conversation. But um, I'm guessing that some of your most experienced investors that are listening to this podcast probably don't go to the MLS as their first choice to buy a property because those are retail properties that are available there. Mm -hmm. They probably want to scurry up opportunities, kind of pocket deals that aren't necessarily publicized. Yeah. So, you know, as a story brand consultant, I'm asking, so how do you reach into that market and not be like a bullhorn on a street corner, just saying, Hey, anybody got a property to sell? Anybody got a property to sell? Mm -hmm. How could you more intentionally strategically position your message that draws the people that have properties that they want to release mm -hmm. uh, to you? Um, and I think story brand is a great methodology that could be used in that space because I've always read you make money in real estate investment when you buy the property right. Yeah, absolutely. And buy it low, sell it high. How do you know you bought it right? Is probably not going to buy it at retail. Mm -hmm. So I think that the story brand framework is probably best. You know, is probably suited well. Uh, maybe not best, but well suited mm -hmm. when you're trying to do like a direct mail campaign or local listing advertisement and trying to drum up new leads of properties that would potentially want to release at a reasonable, fair, win-win value. Mm -hmm. um, I think that could be powerful. Yeah, that's interesting. I, don't, I never had really thought about this too in-depth uh, in this context, but I've got a blog post I wrote years ago called uh, Understanding the Motivated Seller. Like, yeah. why is it that some people are willing to sell their land for a hundred bucks. Who yeah. in their right mind would do that? Because they're totally out there. And some yeah. people think I'm crazy when I say I can find those kinds of people, but they're absolutely out there. And usually like there is a good reason why they're willing to part with it for next to nothing. They don't think about their property the way you and I would, where they want yeah. market value. Like perhaps they inherited it. Maybe they have, you know, back due taxes on it and they don't feel like dealing with that. Maybe they bought it 20 years ago and their plans changed. There's a number of different potential reasons that you could almost sort of like take those reasons. Like for example, delinquent taxes. You can get a delinquent tax list where everybody on this list, like the reason they're there is because they owe property taxes. Like yes. Has to. Yeah. And in your mail piece, when you talk to them, you don't even necessarily have to call them out saying they have delinquent taxes, but more of like exhibiting understanding and showing that you sort of can connect with people yep. that have delinquent taxes. Like perhaps they can't afford it. Perhaps like, you know, they just don't care or perhaps they just yeah. forgot about it or whatever the reason is sort of, figuring out what those potential reasons are and addressing them in sort of like a roundabout way, just showing that we get it, you know, we yes. sort of understand yes. where you're at. And, and as opposed to just saying like, we have been buying land for 10 years and we're great at it. So yeah. accept this offer. They don't like, care. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All they care is that they don't like the tax man calling them. Yeah, uh, sure. and they don't like the pink letters showing up and the blue letters showing up and all that. Yeah. yeah. So problem they don't, you know, tax uh, foreclosed property is eminent for them and doggone it. It's just inconvenient to go through all that solution. We buy properties, but quickly pivot to what success look like after that. So that you can get your life back in order and go back to the things that you really enjoy, you know, yeah. spending time with your family or working or, you know, whatever else you would do in the time that you're currently spending running around trying to stay away from the tax guy. So yeah. 
Would you say like in an introductory letter to those kinds of people, is it better to like have several paragraphs explaining who you are and what you do, or is it better to have like two or three sentences, like getting right to the point? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. I, I'd have to probably give that a, a bit of thought. Um, initially, initially I'm thinking like, are you going to send a whole letter or postcards or what? Well, I know there's, there's a number of different ways you can do it. Yeah. I mean, one way is to do a really small yellow postcard. This is how I did it for several years when I was getting yeah. started, which really only has room for like, you know, a paragraph, maybe two. Yeah. Um, or you can do like a two page letter where the first page is a full page of just like a narrative on who you are and what you have to offer. And then the second page is the offer itself. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's different ways to do it. And it's one of those things like probably depends a little bit on the recipient. Like some people probably would want to know who you are and why you're doing this. Other people might not care at all. They just want to see a number and be done with the property. So I, I don't know that you can really, unless you really have drilled down your list very, 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 very well. Yeah. I don't know that you could really like, you know, put everybody in a tiny little box. You know, it's interesting because I'm, I'm not a land investor like what you are. Um, uh, I have, you know, some uh, investment real estate, but it's not from the raw land, you know, mm -hmm. perspective. So I know you've got, you know, a good bit of experience. I think you've got some other properties too, some duplexes and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, at any rate, I think about it from a story brand perspective. So if you're asking me, Rob, what would you do from a story brand perspective to drum up new opportunities? what I'd probably do is create a pinch page, a landing page that is all about solving the tax foreclosure issue. Mm -hmm. And my direct mail piece would probably not actually be about buying your property. It'd probably be about download this free guide, three mistakes people entering tax foreclosure on the property usually make and how you can prevent them. Mm -hmm. I'd probably make some sort of a, a lead generating hook uh, digital asset in exchange for contact information from that person. And it might be simple like a first name email address, or it might say that's the first page of the form. The second page is, well, what city is your property located in or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I would make it a real simple, simple exchange. And then I would start using that list through as a story brand guide. We have a five part email sequencing that we walk people through that basically brings a cold lead to a warm lead or a cold suspect to a warm lead. So basically it's not you trying to sell to them why you should buy the property. It's them walking to you. And again, back to that pen analogy, they're going to perceive that you get it. Mm -hmm. They want to, you understand you're entering into their story and they are compelled to want to release their property to you in order to avoid some of these pitfalls that you can prevent them yeah. uh, from going down. Yeah. So I I'd probably make it more of a magnet draw thing than a, you know, but I mean, that's a matter of semantics. Your original question, I guess, was about, you know, would you make it paragraphs or short statements? My guess is that most people, when they see a paragraph, probably would toss out, you know, a, a letter of firsthand. So probably the first shot for me would be postcard, mm -hmm. you know, like what you've been doing and make it real short, real concise. And if you really felt good about it, follow up with a snail mail, you know, letter campaign. Mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. Yeah, I actually saw, it's kind of a side note, um, I'd never seen this before, but our local state representative, he sent out this mail campaign and we got it in our mailbox. It, I've never seen anything like it. It was almost like a blog post in the form of like a two page, almost like a book and you fold it up. And the whole mail piece was to just tell people how they can uh, appeal their property taxes. If they feel like their property taxes are too high, what steps they have to go through to get the property taxes lowered. And like, there's no agenda. He's not telling us to do anything. It's like literally just helpful if you're in that situation. But like, I'll tell you, <laughs> none of his competitors have ever done that, that I've ever seen. Yeah. yeah. When it comes time to vote, I'm going to think, oh yeah, this guy was really helpful. Like he helped me and totally didn't need to, like just out of the goodness of his heart. And what, whether I needed it or not, like it was just kind of interesting information that nobody else brought to the table. And uh, I just thought that was kind of a smart way to, uh, you know, get on people's good side. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I don't know, if, I don't know if that really applies to story brand particularly or not, but. Um, was there a problem? Maybe you were, didn't even know that you had this as a problem, yeah. but you <laughs> planted the seed of doubt in your mind. Like, am I paying too much? That's really the problem. Mm -hmm. Never pay too much for property taxes. Mm -hmm. How did he scratch that itch without dragging you through a problem. Yeah. Well, he said, here, 
find out if you're paying too much or how to, how to, how to, uh, you know, renegotiate that. Yeah. Well, appeal. Well, no way. Especially like coming from somebody who is in the government telling me how I can pay the government less money. <laughs> that's a pretty strong statement, especially coming from him that like, he's on my side. Like he cares about what's best for me, not what's best for him and the government that he works for. And like, right there. Like I just, I trust that guy because he didn't have to do that. And he like went out of his way to do what's best for me. So <laughs> it's kind of so, cool. So brilliant. Let's, let's keep this analogy going. Mm -hmm. So he, he helped you create a problem that you didn't even know existed. I'm paying too much for property taxes. Mm -hmm. You told me the next time that you vote step two, what's the solution you're voting for this representative? Yeah. And you're telling me now what life will look like after that. Like he's here to help us mm -hmm. he's here to make my life better, survive and thrive. Mm -hmm. So whether he recognized that the story brand principles are inside of this whole tool that he sent out to you or mm -hmm. not, I don't know. But all three of those elements are addressed in a powerful way. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an overt, explicit, I'm telling you what your problem is. I'm telling you what the solution, I'm telling you what your life is going to be like. As long as you hit those three bells or those three strums on the guitar, those three piano keys, it's going to be beautiful music. And people are going to want to lean into that and listen to it. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we were talking a while back and you were telling me about uh, the trigger word, imagine. Yes. Like how that can be really powerful. Can you <laughs> expand on that a little bit for the people who are listening? Yeah. So here's your pro tip, uh, audience. Um, so any, any kind of marketing messaging, the only reason we're even here talking about this is to help guide prospects, customers, um, you know, to some sort of a decision, some sort of a, a narrative joining a story so that they can make a choice of whether or not to do business with you. In human linguistics, psychology, just using the word imagine is one of the most powerful tools because listen here. So those of you on the podcast listening to this, okay, imagine a brown dog sitting on a lake shore lapping up water as it comes up in waves. Instantly, right now, every one of you listening to this thought about a brown dog sitting on a lakeshore, lapping up water as the waves came up. Using words, I put an image in every listener's mind just by saying the word imagine. Why this is such a powerful tool, it should never, ever be used in manipulation. I certainly don't want to advocate that. Get out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> but the powerful word imagine, especially if we hang right out after imagine with that aspirational identity. So, for instance, imagine what life will feel like when the tax man no longer is calling your, your phone at all hours of the night because your property is about to erode away because of taxes and be foreclosed upon. Or imagine what it will feel like to confidently know that you made a wise real estate transaction. Mm. Imagine what it will feel like to have more residual income from your investments than you ever made in a W-2 ever before. Mm -hmm. Imagine. It basically puts people into a frame of mind where they're like, thinking, what will it feel like? It, it gets them inspired. It's a vision kind of statement of sort. It's yeah. a very powerful tool. And if you can associate that with an aspirational identity that connects with them, who they want to become as a result of engaging your brand or your business, mm -hmm. um, it could be a powerful motivational tool to kind of wake them up, to lean into the story. So yeah. each element of telling the story is only there to give basically so that they give you permission to tell them more so that they lean in deeper into it. And starting off like your postcard idea, just with an imagine statement could be powerful. Yeah, like imagine having cash in your bank account instead of the burden of an unwanted property or imagine. Yeah, yeah, that's good, man. I like that. That's really who's cool. Who's going to connect with that? The people that have those desires. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a great value statement. Yeah. Now, I know selfishly, since I have you, I'm going to run this past you, see if you have any ideas. One of the things that has long been sort of difficult for me is in the cases when I'm trying to wholesale land, and I'll just explain quick uh, what I mean by that. See if there's a property that, you know, I can make an offer on it, the seller will accept it. Um, it's a good deal, but 
I either don't have the cash to purchase it or I don't want to like, I just don't want to tie up my money in that particular property. Maybe it's like instead of 10% of market value, the person is willing to sell it for 40% of market value or something like that. So it's still a good deal, but I don't want to like put that much of my funds into it. But, you know, since it's a good deal, I know that there's almost certainly somebody else out there who would be happy to have that. So one of the strategies you can follow is wholesaling where you basically put the property under contract. So you sign a purchase agreement between myself and the seller. And in that agreement, it gives me the right to assign that contract to somebody else. Yeah. And basically I can then, you know, with the time frame of three months or six months or however long they're willing to give me, I can go and try to find another buyer, put them together and then collect an assignment fee. So basically I get paid whatever I can negotiate along the way and I never have to own the property myself or invest my own cash. So it really just takes my time to try to put these pieces together. And as you can tell, I just took like two minutes to explain all that. And when I try to explain that to a seller, understandably, a lot of them just get confused like, Either they don't get it or they don't want to hassle with oh, that. They're just like, no, yeah. like I just, no, like either you buy a cash right now or we're not doing this. And, and I understand that. Like I really do. I was like, I just, just sold my house and somebody had called me trying to offer me the same thing and I didn't want to do it. So like, I understand that. Um, but what would be a way to like explain that process simply in a way that keeps the person on the hook and doesn't just make them automatically shut down and say no, because it's a little bit more complex than usual. Like what's a more effective way to convey that whole process? Yeah, man, you got my mind just turning here, Seth. Um, so what I heard you saying was you're the wholesaler. You like to buy properties or get properties from sellers under contract and find and assign buyers based on those deals, mm -hmm. right? So you want to be the middleman for it, the broker. Yeah of that transaction. But I heard you explaining that process to me, which is great, like you would be explaining it to a seller. Mm -hmm. And then you told me that the seller gets confused and they just back out and they don't want to be a part of it. Is that an accurate recount of what you just told me? Yeah. And you know, I don't know. It probably depends on the person. I think sometimes confused is the right word to use. Other times, they, they understand it. It's just too many moving pieces and they just don't want to do it. Like they don't yeah. want to tie up their property for six months if it might not even sell. Yeah. Um, basically what, what I'm doing wrong, I think, is I'm like focusing too much on the mechanics and like yep. how it works and not necessarily focusing on what they're going to get out of it. Like I, I don't, I'm not really highlighting the benefits or the stakes yep. well enough. Would you agree with that or, or how would I fix that? Yeah. So I go back to my first two questions. Mm -hmm. Are you helping them survive and thrive? And are you telling it in such a way that's the fewest amount of calories possible? Mm -hmm. Every piece of information that we provide somebody, every detail that we provide them, it's kind of like giving them an eight pound bowling ball that they hold on to. So yes, I have this piece of property. I, I want to sell it. But then Seth just handed me this bowling ball, a brand new idea, a way of selling that I haven't been familiar with before. Uh, this brokered transaction. Okay. Well, how does that work? Then you give them detail number two. It's like giving them a second bowling ball. And mm -hmm. then detail number three, it's a third bowling ball. We're only one minute into your two minute explanation. Mm -hmm. By the time you give them four bowling balls, how many do you think that they drop? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all of them, right? They drop all of the bowling balls because they don't understand. It's too much. It takes too many calories. Mm -hmm. They can quickly understand how it's going to help them survive and thrive. And so they check out you know, my encouragement is, you know, just to go back to those fundamentals, the first two items that we talked about, phrase the whole narrative in such a way where it's about the seller and not even about the wholesaler. Mm -hmm. Wait, good stories don't start with Gandalf. They don't start with Hamish from Hunger Games. They start with Katniss. They start with Frodo. They start with Luke Skywalker. Good stories start with the hero. Don't try to force yourself into the hero's spot. Let the seller be the hero mm -hmm. and understand what's important to them. Start by asking, well, what's important to the seller? Seller wants to make sure that they sell this property quickly, right? They want to get done with it because they probably have another property in mind that they want to get into. Mm -hmm. So let's say that that's the seller's want. They want to sell the property quickly. Well, what's the problem? Depending on the market, maybe they do or do not have a buyer. I think at its basic essence, seller, their problem is that they don't have somebody to buy their property. So they think, well, I need to list it. That's the solution. But you're bringing a different solution to them. You're bringing the solution of this broker transaction. 
Mm -hmm. It can be a little bit confusing for them. So for you to figure out what are your maybe three key pieces of information, super simple, phrased in a way that helps them survive and thrive, and uh, they can connect to it quickly. They don't have to burn a lot of brain calories to understand it. Mm -hmm. I think if you could package the information to that seller in such a way where it's clear and concise, step one, step two, step three, there may be 50 more steps later on, but step one, step two, and step three are easy and portable. It's the make America great again statement mm -hmm. that they can connect to. Yeah. Um, I think they're going to lean in and give you permission to help educate them further into the process mm -hmm. uh, as well. Yeah. So I think that survive and thrive and that burn calories, I think keep that as your top of your mind in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it's rather than like, you know, overcomplicating the explanation of how it all works. So I say something like, issue number one, you have this property that's costing you time, money, mental headspace. It's a problem for you. Right. Issue number two, I have a solution that I think can help you get rid of that problem and put cash in your hands instead. There you go. Yes. Um, and I don't because know. that's important to them. They want to get this problem solved. They want to have that the transaction completed. Yes. Yeah. And then maybe focus on like, think how much better your life will be when this problem is gone. Yes. You, you have liquidity. You can spend the money on things that you actually want to be doing with your life. So on and so forth. Rather than saying, so we take this purchase agreement and get executed. Yeah. And then we, like, don't, yeah. don't go there necessarily. I mean, if they ask, maybe, you know, explain the basics or, or don't even do that. Yeah. Well, if they ask, they give you permission, I think. And even then, I think you walk gingerly on the detail road. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the story brand realms, we have a kind of a framework that we share. It's called the curse of knowledge, mm -hmm. level one to level 10. Many of us have a level 10 understanding of our profession. It's like yeah. the surgical understanding. Mm -hmm. Most people make buying decisions at level one. Mm -hmm. So if we blow them out of the water and over detail, over analyze, over explain ourselves over here at level 10, they're really not going to connect at level one anyway. Mm -hmm. So you really have to gain permission to move them from level one to level two, level three. I wouldn't jump out with, you know, detailed explanation unless they ask specifically for it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, certainly they need to be aware of the contract that they're signing. I'm not implying that at all, but I'm just saying, you know, in theory, the concept of a brokered transaction, if it's foreign to them, I would hesitate to even use legalese or even mention you know, some of the, um, you know, statements that are in the contract, you know, in, I would do it all in layman's terms mm -hmm. uh, in a way that's less intimidating for them. And wh what you're saying, that, uh, the curse of knowledge, is that what it's called? The curse of knowledge. That's exactly yeah. it. That, that's a huge deal. And it's something that I have noticed with a lot of people, especially like in the blogging space, like the education right. world, because most people, by the time they're able to educate somebody on anything, they have to be pretty smart. Like they've been through a lot. They've experienced a lot. They know a lot. But to like dumb it down and like give it to somebody at the fifth grade entry level uh, understanding, yeah. that is not easy for a lot of people. And I actually had a, uh, one of my friends is a uh, certified financial planner. I think he's probably one of the best at what he does. But the way that he was explaining my <clears throat> options and things that he could do to help me, like it was, it was so over my head, like explaining all this like stock market terminology that I don't spend a lot of time in that realm. And like I, about half of what he was saying, I didn't even get it. Like it was just going right over my head. And, and because of that, like it made me, I just wasn't really interested because I didn't get what he was saying, you know? So um, really important to understand your audience and oh, yeah. w whether they're sophisticated or not, know how to simplify it and explain it in ways that doesn't require them to look up definitions and things like that. Absolutely, brother. And you know what? You're spot on that most people that have that level 10 understanding, they do have a hard time toggling down. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they're so close staring at the tree that they have a hard time seeing the whole perspective of the forest. Mm -hmm. And that's where uh, me as a certified story brand guide, I come alongside clients to help them gain that perspective from the outside. Even today, land investing and some of the things that you're involved in, I'm an outsider in. So I haven't been cursed by the knowledge of having such a close understanding of those yeah able to provide perspective to step a little bit away and to say you know what think about this from the perspective of the user the client mm -hmm. the customer what kind of questions what kind of issues are they facing and how can we phrase this in such a way where it's absolutely accurate to the product or service that you're trying to provide but it doesn't blow them out of the water with so much knowledge that they feel like it's too many calories for me to understand this so i'm just going to tune it out mm -hmm. yeah well 
I really appreciate your time, Rob, a lot. There's a lot here. Kind of just scratch the surface. There's, there's so much to learn. And, like, it's extremely powerful if you can harness even part of this. Like, it, it has totally changed the way that I look at my the messages that I'm putting out into the world, even on a personal level, just, like, as I explain different concepts to people. Like, I just have a better set of tools to do that now. So I would totally recommend at the very least checking out, you know, Don Miller's books, uh, building a story brand. I'll link to it in the show notes for this episode. And Donald Miller also has a, an online course, like a, a workshop. Yes. Um, which, uh, Rob's got an affiliate link for that. It's I'll link up to it. It's at uh, retipster.com forward slash story brand course. And, uh, Rob does get a small commission from that just so everybody's aware, but it, it is a fantastic, uh, learning tool. I've been through it and it's very, very powerful stuff. And Rob, you have a website. If people want to learn more about you or get a hold of you for any reason, how can they contact you? Yeah, that's right. My website is hughesguide.com. So H U G H E S guide.com. Um, there's information over there, resources that could be um, of service to you. One thing I'll say about the online workshop that's going to be linked in your show notes there, Seth, a lot of people say, you know, the idea of creating a message that helps my clients engage is compelling. How do I actually go about doing that in my business? And for those that in, enter this online workshop, you will leave the workshop with a clarified message. Uh, on the other side of that um, uh, workshop uh, login, you're going to see a downloadable workbook and sessions that Don Miller himself actually walks you through the creation of your clarified message. So everything that we've talked about today and a ton more of step-by-step -step process is on the other side of that. And I would strongly recommend anybody who's looking to create a message that helps more business uh, engage with their business, more clients come in to engage their business. They're going to increase revenue by clarifying their message and applying those principles. Yeah. And I think, um, first time you introduced me to this, Rob, I, I think it's actually uh, free uh, to check out the actual um, brand script where it basically helps you understand. It's like a, a question and answer process where right. you kind of just like helps you organize your thoughts based on whatever your product or service is or whatever it is you're bringing to the market. You can identify, I think there's seven different uh, things in terms of what goes into the story and how you put that together. And it was super helpful for me. Uh, it's at mystorybrand.com. I'll link to that in the show notes as well in case we can check that out. Great. Um, at the very least, you know, give that a whirl. See if that helps you uh, come up with a more clarified story for your brand or your business. That's right. Cool. Well, Rob, anything else you want to share before we wrap this up? Just, uh, you know, let me close with this. A lot of people, a lot of companies waste a ton of money on marketing. Mm -hmm. Remember that, that adage that you said, if you confuse, you lose. Noise truly is the enemy mm -hmm. that we're trying to fight against and to, and to clarify your message. So people are wasting a ton of money in marketing. It doesn't have to be that way. Engage the story brand framework, clarify your message, and see sales and revenue increase. Um, so, and if you need some help along the way, that's my role as a certified story brand guide is to come alongside and to walk with you through that journey to make sure that you really maximize your story brand investment. Um, so again, you can check me out over at HughesGuide.com and uh, fill out the contact form. We can begin that conversation if that'd be of service to you. Uh, but it's great to be with you today as well, Seth. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks again, Rob. Um, yeah, I, again, I've known Rob for years. Can't say enough great things about him. He's a honest, straightforward, trustworthy guy. And, uh, he's, he's meant a lot to me, just his friendship in my life. So, but thanks again to everybody for listening. Appreciate, uh, your interest and your time and hopefully we'll see you again in the next video.